questioning is perhaps the greatest gift we have as human beings. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that teaches us to question everything we think we know. Science came about by developing techniques, methodologies for gaining reliable knowledge about the world. We have at our fingertips the technologies that were only possible for the largest governments and corporations 20 years ago as an individual today. If the human civilization continued at anything remotely like the current pace of technology advancement for a million years, where would we be? I think we're either extinct or on a lot of planets. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. We hold the scientific method in high regard because it works. If it stopped working, we'd throw it out. Discover the past. Create the future. This, this, this is the Here and How Podcast. Welcome to the Here and How Podcast, where every episode we dive deep into big ideas, exploring the past so that we can create a brighter future. This is episode two. And I am your host today, Thomas Westbrook, along with my co-hosts, Rachel Oates and Steve Woodford. We're going to be diving in to the Drake Equation and the Fermi Paradox. Where are all the aliens? This is episode two. Rachel, Mm -hmm. Steven, have either of you ever seen a UFO? Ooh. So I I think I did when I was younger, but it probably wasn't an actual alien. But I did, I had this alien book, um, and it was about, you know, it, it had things like this in, and, you know, the stuff we've done to try and contact aliens in the past. And he also had silly stuff, like, about people who think they've seen aliens and people who think they've seen UFOs. And on one page, there was a picture of UFOs as these kind of, like, almost, like, boomerang-shaped things. And one day, I was tiny, I was probably, like, six years old, and I saw one flying across the sky that was that shape, and I was really excited, and I thought I'd seen a UFO, and I was, like, so sure there were aliens. But looking back, it was probably, you know, a bird or a plastic bag or an actual boomerang <laughs> so <laughs> you know if, if someone was to like throw a plastic bag or even just a bag went past you and it went so quick that you saw it but you couldn't identify what it was is that not then an unidentified flying object so you can go yeah i've seen a ufo someone threw a peanut and i didn't know it was a peanut or something like that that, like, that is true does that fit in <laughs> Okay, then, there you go. I have seen a UFO. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like everyone, everyone's seen a UFO. It's like, oh, I didn't see one like that. Unidentified was. flying penis. <laughs> <laughs> <A> UFP. <laughs> or uh, if you're. If you, 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 you ever. I was just thinking, you can make it an unide- unidentified flying Oreo. You know, then you get to see the action room. <laughs> um, have I seen a UFO? You know, I, I mean, I say this facetiously, but. I mean, it really does depend on how you define it. If it's something, if it is an unidentified flying object, then yeah, I've I've seen loads, um, unidentified to me at least. Um, but as for a UFO in general, no, I haven't seen it. And if I had, I would suspect that I'm probably hallucinating. But um, yeah. so you what don't you, spend Thomas? your weekends hanging out with aliens? Oh no, I do that. Yeah. yeah. Oh okay, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I lived in Texas. I spent a lot of weekends hanging out with uh, aliens. <laughs> Brilliant. I, I don't know if all of them were legal or illegal. <laughs> I didn't ask. <laughs> I was going to go there, but it's good. You set the tone. Now, I, now, now I'm at home. <laughs> Fantastic. So today we're talking about, um, first off, the Drake Equation, which before people who are not mathematically inclined just turn off the podcast, it's, uh, we're going to simplify it, make it easy to understand. But it was basically this, this guy named Frank Drake, who he was in the year 1960, he was working for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, or NRAO. And he was trying to figure out if there was you know, any basis for the the idea that there should be some type of intelligent life out there trying to communicate with us, which I don't know why anyone would want to communicate with us because, you know, we eat Tide Pods. Hey, I'm smart. <laughs> Pe- well, aliens would want to communicate with me, I think. M- maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no one else, just you, Rachel. Yeah. Just Rachel. So, uh, like that's, this that's alien she, land that's walks why they right sent past her the us. Plastic bag. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to it communicate. All, yeah, it all makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy, Frank Drake, he was trying to figure out, you know, is it even likely that there's aliens out there? 
And um, so he basically took, I think it was like a napkin or something. And I, this, this might just be folklore, but he was kind of just wrote down uh, an equation for how to figure out how to determine if um, there are aliens out there. And then, then he came and there was, I think it was some big meeting with uh, Carl Sagan or somebody. And he, he basically presented this equation. Uh, sometimes it's called the Sagan Drake equation, but it was it was to figure out how many civilizations are there out there right now in the galaxy that can communicate with us. And we're going to kind of go through some of the the different parameters of the Drake equation. But the, the first thing to, to take in mind is that the Drake equation is pure speculation because it has, um, it's like seven different parameters, but only the first three can we even, you know, possibly hope to know with any kind of certainty. The rest of them are pure speculation, but it's just, it takes in, into account. I'll, I'll just run through these super quick. Um, the number of, um, Broadcasting civilizations is what we're trying to determine. So, so what what would an example of that be? Um, like okay, there's there's a species of Martians living on Mars, and they're trying to um like send us a message. You mean? Yeah, and I mean it. It could be like any kind of life form, right? Oh, okay. Sure. So, 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 so you could have. Yeah. But I I guess what you mean is like you know, they have to be intelligent and they have to have that level of technology or development to be able to send a message, right? Exactly. Yeah. So they, they don't, they could be um, a robotic civilization yeah. that was created. So we're not, they could be, we're not just talking about like some tiny bacteria on the other yeah. side of the galaxy. Precisely. Yeah. The, the thing that you mentioned about machines, by the way, um, it's only a semantic difference, but that wouldn't count as life, would it? Um, because mm. life is, is it necessarily biological? Like, I don't think it necessarily should be, but that is the kind of way we look at it at the present. I, I don't but, know, because it's like, would it have to be carbon-based life like we are, or could it be some mm. other kind of life, you know? Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest things in determining if something is alive is the ability to self-replicate. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, there's bacteria and, and viruses and mm -hmm. stuff that... Uh, viruses, we are kind of blurry. We don't really mm -hmm. see them as living so much because they're not able to self-replicate. They have to rely on, on a host, mm -hmm. a host DNA. And That's true. Whereas, you know, if, if a robot was able to replicate itself, then it could potentially be seen as life. Because not all life is intelligent. Yeah. So just just curious, how how does viruses um, replicate? Does, you said that it has to rely on, on a host. So does that mean that it uses the resources of the host in order to have the energy to replicate? Or well, usually um, a virus, and I'm not a biologist, nor have I researched <laughs> this for this particular episode. <laughs> but if, if I'm if I remember my uh, my college biology classes well enough, and it's been a while then they, they tap into the cells of, of the host that they've infected and they utilize the, the host cells mechanism to, um, to replicate their own DNA. Yeah. So viruses oh, only have RNA. So they basically, like, they already have a single strand of RNA and they use the kind of cell body that they're inhabiting to create a second strand to kind of make it temporarily DNA and then that splits off in another little viruses kind of formed as part of that that's putting it way too simply but no that's cool yeah. okay so it's so it's not dna it's rna yeah no viruses only have rna mm. okay. from what that's i remember <laughs> this is going okay. back like five years now last time that's i studied this because uh, our rna's existed for ages hasn't it mm -hmm. it's it's dna that's relatively yeah. recent so that's yeah, that's really interesting there's actually a, a couple of theories when it comes to abiogenesis and how life came from no life that prior to DNA that there was, you know, simply RNA and that RNA was how everything started off. But yeah. um, we'll, we'll get into that more with uh, when we do an episode yeah. on abiogenesis. That'll be fun. That'll be a great episode. For sure. And it will consist so, of us all talking for an hour and then saying we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll we'll act super smart and then at the end we'll be like, <laughs> yep. So kind of like this episode. <laughs> and every other one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them until the end, Rachel. Oh, sorry, I have spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> so the 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 
number of broadcasting civilizations is base, basically any civilization that is communicating in a way that we would be able to detect, and specifically radio waves. That's what we've been listening on is, you know, it travels at the speed of light, and so we have these big dishes that we point up into the sky and we search throughout space trying to figure out if there's a civilization out there that is trying to talk to us, or that we can eavesdrop in on that's not trying to talk to us. <gasps> Like Good stuff, and so. and the waves that goes at the speed of light, right? Exactly. Cool. So, where when we try to figure out if there are any civilizations out there, we have to to take into account that um, these different parameters. One is you know the average rate of formations of a suitable star in the Milky Way galaxy that would have then um, we take into account the fraction of stars that form planets the average number of habitable planets per star, the fraction of habitable planets where life emerges, the fraction of habitable planets where life uh, with life where intelligent life evolves, and then the fraction of planets with intelligent life capable of interstellar communication and the years of civilization remains detectable. So that's kind of a mouthful of, of different parameters, but essentially we're trying to figure out of all the stars in the, the galaxy, and right now we're just focusing on the Milky Way galaxy. We're not looking at all of the other billions of galaxies out there. But just in our own galaxy, how many civilizations are broadcasting? And if you start throwing in parameters, there's there's kind of two different extremes. One is that like life is extremely common and that every single civilization that forms um, develops life. But then they ju- it doesn't last long, and it just gets wiped out. And so, you know, there's there's a very small window that they're communicating. And then the other extreme is that life lives for a really long time, and it, it's very successful and colonizes out into to other stars. Um, but life is extremely, extremely rare and, like, never happens. So I, I want to share, like, two things that I've been considering lately. Um, for a long time, I've realized that basically basically wherever we kind of find water, we find life. So it's 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 everywhere, you know. It existed on the planet, like, I think it goes back about 4.1 billion years ago. And that's, you know, while the Earth is, you know, being bombarded by accretion, etc. Um, but the, what's quite interesting is that it seems to be that life, or at least RNA, or its rudimentary state, seems to be pretty much everywhere. Like, they find it in lava. You know, it, it's just, it can survive anywhere. I think there's, like, a certain type of bacteria or something that can last, like, 10 years without any water. It's it's bizarre, like, how it functions at that level. But, so if you take, uh, I think it's one of Saturn's moons, Europa, and because of the way it orbits, they, they suspect that water or H2O might manifest there as a solid, a liquid and a gas. And so it's made scientists speculate that there might be life there. So from that perspective, and it's only rudimentary, I can I already have like the opinion that life's probably quite abundant. But it, it seems that if you take all life today and you look at their DNA, it all com- comes back to a single ancestor. Which that tells me that there's a certain stage that's very, very rare or is certainly hard to to go through so that life might be abundant. But DNA or um, intelligent life might be really, really rare. I just thought I'd um, throw that up for what you guys think to those two facts particularly and maybe how exactly they they work into the Drake equation. No, I, I definitely think that's kind of the case, because if you look back at just the Earth and um, kind of how we got to the point where we are today, there were definitely at least two or three major points where they, um, I don't want to say predict, but they um, they at least assume or worked out that there were two or three major points where l- most life on Earth was just wiped out for one reason or another, whether it was wi- mm. via disease or some kind of temperature change or environmental change or something like that. So it does seem like there are these big kind of stages where it's kind of <sighs> all or nothing in terms of what survives and what doesn't. So I think... <sighs> I, I feel like my words aren't coming out properly here, but what I'm trying to say is that it makes sense that that would happen on other planets. And maybe there just hasn't been any specific species that's got past that point yet. Yeah, no, it's like, it's you know? very hard for us to make predictions based on the yeah. fact that we only have one example of life to... to And so we can't really generate 
you know, sweeping answers because we yeah. only have what we have to work with. So, yeah, I, I see where you're coming from mm-hmm. there. And we haven't exactly been around a long time either. And we no. haven't been looking well, for these things for a long time. So mm. One interesting thing that's, that's kind of changed since the 1960s when, when Fermi came up with this equation is our understanding of what's required for life has evolved. Okay. Mm. So, you know, at the time you were talking, um, Stephen, about uh, different bacteria that can, you know, ex- uh, extremophiles that can live in either like thermophiles in extreme heat or, or that can ex- live for long periods of time without water. Yeah, I think I learned that from you, by the way. I think you told mm-hmm. me that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're actually recording this episode a second time just because the the first take was a, a bit rough. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's there's I think the tardigrade can survive basically in outer space, mm. and you know we've seen different um, amino acids, different building blocks for life on uh, meteors. So it's you know, it's it's not too outside the realm of possibility to think that, hey, if, if life can, you know, form or survive or even thrive in extreme situations, it's not too unlikely to think that it might be extremely common throughout the universe. Mm. But it, intelligent life is where it starts to break down. Yeah. Um, as yeah. far as, you know, whether or not you could have um, intelligent thinking life, how many instances do we have of that? You know, we we just have the one. Mm -hmm. And so even if we find billions of planets and billions of stars and we look up and we're like, oh, hey, like, you know, all of these planets that we've discovered. And I I think it's um, the the Kepler telescope has discovered hundreds of, of different exoplanets that are outside of our solar system. And do you guys know how they determine um, what these these uh, or how they they find planets around other stars? Uh not really, I don't know. Yeah, enlighten us, good sir. <laughs> so if, if let's say that you're looking up through a telescope at, at a star, and you suddenly see that, like, this star got a little bit dimmer, and then you wait uh, a period of time, and it gets dimmer again. Oh. And then you wait the exact same amount of time as between the first and the second, between the second and the third, there's a third dimming. Then you suddenly, you can tell that there's, something in orbit around this this star so you know you can whenever like a a planet passes in front of of a star and you're between the planet and the the, or the the planet is between you and the star then you're going to see a a certain amount of dimming that occurs now you can also use um, spectroscopy to measure the the light waves that are coming in and you can see on a graph you know what this planet is made out of so you can see oh hey there's um, this much water, there's this much, or there's this much hydrogen, there's this much oxygen, there's this much carbon. And you can kind of get a rough idea of, you know, is this a gas giant? Is this a terrestrial planet that could be habitable? And you can kind of start to get a, a better picture of what the, the stars or what the planets out there that are orbiting nearby stars are made out of. That is so smart. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting. Is that is that the best methods we have for, for detecting um, other planets around other other stars, or do do you know if we have other ways, like by using infrared or uh, ultraviolet? Um, I, I I believe that there's also, and I'm I'm not an astronomer, but I believe that one of the methods that they use is detecting wobbles. So like if there's a uh, a they can see like that the gravity of the planet is causing a star to wobble. Then I, I think that's one way. Um, but this, yeah, this would definitely be a, a more, uh, an interesting area to do more research on. And I encourage our listeners to, um, but basically right now we, we, we've discovered, we've detected several hundred planets. Some of them are terrestrial. Some of them are uh, similar in size to earth. And, uh, some of them even look like they have, they might have water on them. So, Ooh. you know, the, but aside from that. Do you know how many uh, planets we've detected that are emitting any kind of radio waves? None. Um, e- oh. Yes, I think, I, well... Wait, can yeah. radio waves be emitted naturally? Yeah, like... I, oh. Mm. Oh, then I don't <laughs> we know. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually haven't detected any intelligent signals mm-hmm. from outer space. 
So I was um, right. Do I get a point? That you know, you said that SETI, <laughs> SETI has been searching, you know, very mm. uh, consistently for decades. Although it's we're still we you know so we're only scratching the surface of of what might be out there. If that if if, if we've been searching for decades, so I, I don't know what it is. Do, do you happen to know? Should we say fifty years or so? Or um... I want to say since uh, the sixties. Okay, yeah. sure. So if, if we say that you know we've been searching for sixty, seventy years or or whatever. My math is obviously brilliant. Um, <laughs> that means that we've searched around us for 60, uh, 60 light years, right? No, si- yes. yeah, yeah, 60 light years, which I, I think it's Neil deGrasse Tyson. I can't remember who said it, but is that not like putting a glass in the sea and then looking at it and going, look, there's no whales? Like, it's just, it's well, such a small quick, area. A quick clarification on that. Mm. Um, we have not, like, We've been broadcasting out radio waves for about a hundred years, so our reach is only about a hundred light years. So, if there's any alien civilizations outside of that uh, area, they would not be able to detect us yet. But there might be an alien civilization that existed that that was maybe a hundred thousand light years away that was broadcasting a hundred thousand light years ago. And we would just now be receiving it. Yeah. So, you know, we we might be picking up, you know, or we might pick up something, you know, at 10 years from now that's like, oh, my God, we're getting a signal from this alien civilization. <laughs> but that they could was be long dead. Out thousands yeah. of years ago or millions of years ago. Yeah, that's Which would kind of be sad. It's such an immense amount of space. I remember yeah. one of the first scientific facts anyone taught me that blew my mind is they said the star i don't know how far away it is but he's but he said this is my granddad he said if you got a telescope that was powerful enough from a planet going around that sun that star um and you looked at earth like just it was just powerful enough to see it you would see the dinosaurs because the light Mm. hasn't traveled fast enough for it to get there yet so like when it comes to space the, the the just how big and long and just it, it's just so it seems so big and so almost unfathomable that let's just say for example aliens did exist and like it's the best case scenario for the people that want aliens and you know they're 60 light years uh, let's say 100 light years away and they detect us and they immediately go right we we want to go and see the this civilization assuming that Einstein's right. They can't go any faster than the speed of light, so it's going to take them a hundred years to get here. Yes, the the that's true. The flip side to that is that if you have you look at the age of the Milky Way, right, and it's like thirteen point five billion years, right. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's going to be some time at the beginning for, you know, for life to kick off and to evolve. And we don't know if maybe we were slow. Maybe there's a, an alien civilization that was much, much faster and they their planet was much more suitable for life early on. And maybe they developed a, a few billion years ago because our mm-hmm. Earth, you know, is only like four point something billion years old. Right. Yeah. So there's other planets that have been around longer that maybe they, they evolved much quicker. The Milky Way is huge. It is massive. But if you have an alien civilization, you start to factor in, you know, we love to explore. The the human race has really, from the, the beginning of time, has been exploratory. And even before we built ships to go and explore uh, America, there were people that took the long way, that, that walked across, that, you know, there, there were people that beat us. We explored every single corner, pretty much, of of the our habitable regions of but, our planet. So just just to throw something out, don't you think that humans kind of we explore not for the sake of exploring? It seems that we explore if there's benefit in it. So we need a new area. We're we're running out of resources. We, you know, um, our population's getting too big, and we need to expand. Because when there was like competition to go to the moon, for example, um, there was reason, there was drive behind it. We wanted to go, but as soon as that competition kind of died out. We haven't really achieved as much as people hoped. And it's kind of because human nature maybe isn't that um, adventurous. Because if we're going to run on the lines that whatever alien life exists, it's going to be under at least some 
principles that are the same as us. So natural selection. Natural selection doesn't pick curiosity over everything else. In fact, the fact that we're intelligent and we have, you know, we're able to conceive the universe. Um, this, this, if all of Earth is showing us, all of life is showing us that we currently know that that's not what's generally selected for. You know, it's normally bigger teeth or larger, larger claws. <laughs> Um, that's actually a good point that natural selection oftentimes punishes curiosity yeah but we still have pressures that push us and it's not just the human race you'll see certain insects or bacteria or things that that in a very short period of time can just spread out throughout you know changes in, in a population can just spread out throughout a, you know the entire world or, or you know a new variation of of some uh, virus or some insect gets introduced to a new region and, and within a few years it's like just exploded out and ballooned out so it's it's not too unlikely to think though that if space exploration was cheaper that you know if if it was more feasible if our technology was more advanced to where all of us could have rockets you know that as earth fills up and as you know pollution and and you know, or just overpopulation or whatever reason uh, pushes us outwards or, you know, trying to avoid extinction or the earth is expanding that, that our race, and it's likely to think that other alien races functioning also under evolutionary pressures would expand out throughout the galaxy. And yeah, sure. Sure. Do you know, do you know how many times do either of you know how many times in the, the, the course of the, the lifespan of the Milky way, um, that an alien civilization could have, have populated um, the, the the entire galaxy. Did did you say the um the Milky Way has been around for thirteen point eight billion? I think it's it's thirteen point something. One second, age of the yeah, we got the internet. Thirteen people. point five one. <laughs> awesome. So is that basically just as old as the universe beginning, or um is the universe a bit older? I, I haven't brushed up on my numbers recently. I was just curious. Like, that's quite interesting if, if our galaxy kind of basically came into existence due, at, at the Big Bang. That's very, very cool. Um, yeah. So the, the universe, uh, um, our, our, um, our best estimate is 13.82 billion. I see. That's why I was confusing. That makes sense. So it was a few hundred yeah. billion years. Or not, not hundred, few hundred million years. Yes. Oh, awesome. So so your question, sorry to detract, was um, uh, how many times aliens could, or life could have become conscious in that time span? Or how many, how, how long, or how many times could alien uh, civilizations colonize the entire Milky Way galaxy? Like how long would it have taken them? And in that, the course of the the age of the Milky Way, how many times could they have colonized it? Given how long it would take to do it, you how, know, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, how you big is the Milky Way? Or could they? Could they at all? Yeah, though? that's exactly what I was yeah. going to ask. Like, how big is the Milky Way? I mean, poor, poor Thomas here. He's like, I'm yeah. just trying to present this. And we're like, <laughs> tell me, good sir, what is the answer to this question? <laughs> but, um, but, but like, like no matter where they start so, from, it's not just a matter of like traveling from planet to planet. It would be to colonize as well. So they'd need yeah. to like get to a point where they're intelligent enough. They have the tech. They can afford to go to the next planet and then build up a whole colony and life there. And then move mm. on to another planet and build it up there. And I mean, even and, if they're doing like 10 planets um, at once, that's going to take a long time. Yeah. And imagine if they are super, you know, a species and an alien that's mm -hmm. super advanced, they could essentially plug themselves into like a matrix and take up no room at all on their own planet and use almost yeah. no resources because they know how to utilize the potential energy in an atom, etc. Yeah. And they could just live a wonderful life and not have to even remotely consider any of this stuff you know they could if they're really technological advanced um they could basically make it so that one minute in actual time is mm -hmm. an entire lifetime for them and they just yeah they do it that way you know um so assuming motive that they would th so, that, or assuming that yeah carol so the the to answer the first question the milky way galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across that's not, and it's not as, as so much that, as I thought. No, I didn't. I thought it was way bigger. 
Yeah, so... So that, that's just that's our galaxy. That's not the universe. Yeah. I see, so there's, yeah, yeah. there's so, other galaxies that are, are billions of light years away. Yeah. So that's 100,000 years of traveling at max speed, assuming that Einstein's right. Um, which, assuming we could reach the speed of light. Assuming we can re- reach it, you know, and assuming that, yeah, basically it's on Einstein theory in, uh, theory in that sense. You you know, if someone was trying deliberately to just expand and then get somewhere and immediately just drop off packages and then keep expanding, mm-hmm. then it's a hundred thousand years mm-hmm. you could conceive that it could be done. That, like, that's a blink. A hundred thousand bl- years to travel from one end to the other. Yeah. But let's That's let's a blink say, though, isn't it? That's that's nothing in, in when you're yeah. talking let's, at thirteen point eight billion, etc. Exactly. If- let's take into account the the power of exponential growth though. Oh yeah. Yeah. So let's say that you have an alien civilization that they start off like us and maybe they, you know, they started off several billion years ago and they got extremely highly advanced. Maybe they're able to travel at the speed of light, you know, just across the universe and that they go out in two different directions. They colonize two planets and they stay there for 5000 years. And they have their highly advanced technology, you know, that allows them to for to do interstellar space travel. And they get there 5,000 years. You know, you think of, of the human population 5,000 years ago and how long it's taken us to get to this point. It's not too unlikely that they would be able to completely colonize a planet in 5,000 years. Oh, easy. Yeah. Easy peasy. So 5,000 years time, they colonize a new planet. Let's assume that every single colony is 100% successful, doesn't get wiped out by meteors or asteroids or whatever. But then that planet then branches out and goes and colonizes two more. Mm -hmm. 5,000 years later, those two colonize two more. Oftentimes, we're not able to think in exponential terms, but the the difference between um, exponential growth and linear growth is like I think, oh God, what's the the analogy where like if you take like fifty two steps, um, then you know you're only outside your door. But if every step is like multiplied by you know two or something, you'd be like all the way across America or so <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. all the way across the, the yeah. universe or some like massive, massive like like we don't think in terms of exponential growth. No, but but it's you know yeah. if. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. You just expand enormously. And while these are time frames that are huge to us, little puny humans, it is nothing yeah. in the grand scheme of things. So Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's assuming that these alien civilizations are that they're just going and that they're settling and staying put. And that there's not, you know, they go and then twenty years later they send out another ship and twenty years later they send out another like yeah. that's assuming that there's five thousand years between each new um outreach to to colonize new planets. Maybe they're colonizing thousands at a time. That's yeah. True. But you also have to take into and, account the time it took for them to like get to the point where they could do that in the first place. Like it took us sort of what, a few billion years? So yeah, like it, well You know, to go from like no yeah. life to where we are today yeah that's true but so we if if the age of the milky way is 13.5 yeah. billion years and we assume and life kind of started when the, within those first few thousand years it would probably take the first like four billion years to maybe get to where we are now plus another yeah. thousand years on top of that you so, know um, well, so our planet our planet's only like four billion years old yeah and yeah. and so there could have been a planet that existed for four billion years before our, our planet mm-hmm. ever came around. And not only yeah. that, like even if it took an immense amount of time for life to first emer- first emerge, and an immense amount of time for them to become technologically advanced, um, once they're advanced, mm-hmm. in low no less than a, I mean, this is way too much time, but in a billion years, it could absolutely. Mm-hmm. Co- you know be absolutely everywhere oh, yeah. um they could become the virus of the universe kind of thing um yeah. so yeah it's it's quite it's quite crazy to think of it so if you way. take a, a hundred thousand light years mm-hmm. and you know and you say that that they're branching out you know that they're that maybe they're traveling one light year or something and then they're spending five thousand years just in one place and then they're branching out to two you know a hundred thousand times five thousand you know that that's only 500 million years 
Yeah. It's not. You know, for them to, to travel a year and then wait 5,000 and then... In the grand know, scheme of things, that's nothing. That's, but then yeah. you also factor in exponential growth. Mm. And that every 5,000 years, it's branching off into two. And it's it's very conceivable. Now, that that is assuming that they are able to travel at the speed of light. We, we haven't gotten anywhere close to that. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere close. And that they care. And that's the way they yeah. want to pursue uh, this. There is, like as you said at the beginning, is very... Uh, speculative it's it's mm-hmm. built on assumptions but can it happen yes um yeah i i, I wouldn't say i'm yeah yeah i mean the, the way you've put it is very convincing it, it can, that can happen you know yeah and and even if even if they haven't colonized everything by now then you know maybe they uh they, they would have colonized enough of it for it to be detectable mm-hmm. or you know that they would have sent out some type of probes. Maybe they're not colonizing every planet, but maybe they're sending out uh, a Van Neumann probe, which basically is is goes to um, communicate mm-hmm. or a Bracewell probe. Um, that you know, perhaps these probes are going and they're, they're self replicating, and they're you know then sending out more probes to more locations, and the probes are exponential, and we we should have come across some type of of alien probe. Um, a Bracewell probe is, is for communication. A Van Neumann probe, I believe, is for self-replication. But you'd think that we would have something like that, that maybe it's just sitting here waiting for us to come up with uh, radio waves or some way of detecting us, and that then it'll turn on, it switches on, and it, it appears and communicates to us from some ancient alien civilization. But, but we, we haven't seen anything like that. But, but I think to expect that we... I mean, we're thinking about things in the grand scheme of things. We're talking millions, billions of years, and we're saying, yeah, it's totally possible in that sense. But as we said earlier, if our waves that we sent out 100 years ago or so, that it's been detected, or, you know, it's going to be detected when it hits something that can receive it, um, it's going to take an immense amount of time, unless they're very close by, um, and care, etc., to come to us. So it seems to me that it's just we just we just don't live long enough it's just there's not enough time to 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 judge whether or not to to, to even ask the question why aren't they answering us it's <laughs> it's like you ring someone up and in the first millisecond you're going oh there's no one answers <laughs> um, well, that, and that, that's where we're we're starting to get into some of the solutions to the paradox because the, that's the fermi paradox basically says if it's possible for them to expand out into the universe, and if there's all these civilizations that, that might exist out there, then where are they? Like, where the hell are they? Mm. So, Ra- Rachel, you were saying? Yeah, I was just going to add that that kind of, like, brings us back to the Drake equation, in that, like, I think it's worth mentioning that the Drake equation isn't necessarily a set equation that you can pump specific numbers into and get an output, like, not in the way that some, like, physics um, equation is. The idea be- behind the Drake equation that it was was that it was meant to start this conversation. It was meant to start getting people asking, "Is there life out there?" It was meant to start these processes of us sending out messages. It was meant to start people looking into researching if there are ways we can, you know, communicate with other species. If there are any messages being sent back to us, it was meant to kind of kickstart this research, kickstart these discussions, so that in 50, 100, 1,000, 100,000 years, we can still keep looking for this stuff, even if there isn't time to get it in this generation. Does that that make sense? (laughs) Exactly. It's it's like, it's not a scientific equation in the sense that, you know, you, you think of, you know, Newtonian physics or general relativity yeah. or something, and, and you can use formulas, scientific formulas, to land a probe on a comet with extreme accuracy. Yeah. And you're not able to do that, like anything remotely similar to that with the Drake equation. It's basically you can plug in a huge variety of of inputs into it. Yeah. And the the last four parameters are just speculation. Mm-hmm. You know, the number of years a civilization remains detectable. Well, the only civilization we have is our our um, our own, you know, input that that yeah. we know about is us. Yeah. So we're like, well, we've we've lived as a broadcasting civilization for about a hundred years, where we've been broadcasting radio waves out into space. We don't know if maybe tomorrow we're going to be, you know, there's going to be some super volcano that destroys everything <laughs> on Earth, 
and that the average civilization only lasts for a hundred years where it's detectable. Or, or it might even be that um, if you look at like the correlation between CO2 emissions and temperature, it like follows a thousand years afterwards. It might be that us, we're going to do exactly what crap tons of civilizations have done. And that is that you get into to an age of industrialization, you destroy your own zone, ozone layer, and the ramifications come a thousand years later and wipe you off the planet. Um, it could be that a load of them just, they don't get past that barrier. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's where, you know, as we'll start diving into some of the, the solutions to the paradox of, you know, why is it? Um, but it's important to, to take that note, though, that Rachel made that the Drake equation, basically, the whole purpose of it is to show us that it's possible. Mm -hmm. It's possible that there's other civilizations out there. There's a wide variety of inputs that we can throw in here and that even on different extremes, it's very likely that there's some type of civilization. And now we get into the Fermi paradox. Mm -hmm. If it exists, if there is an alien civilization, why haven't we detected them? And the, the first, kind of the most fun one that I, I want to touch on is, uh, you know, they're already here. You know, to the... <laughs> the um, <laughs> X-Files theme song and uh, put your tinfoil hats on but why do, why do you guys think that that's uh, not very feasible? Do you, do you want to go first? Um, I, I think it's perfectly feasible actually and I think um, one of them could be on this podcast right now <laughs> not naming names but <laughs> yes um, yeah no seriously though I think <sighs> We we kind of, I don't want to say we know too much about what's on this planet, because we don't at all, but I think if there was something extraterrestrial here, we'd probably have detected it right by now. Um, they'd have probably tried to make some kind of contact by now. It well, would. what if the government has, and it's all a conspiracy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. I don't really see any... Um, plausible reasons as to why you'd cover it up that much or why they'd want to hide or why you wouldn't tell the public like without going into like crazy conspiracies i just i it doesn't seem logical let's say yeah. that the, the wackiest of conspiracies in in that mm. area is true you know like an, an, a an alien ship crashed and the mm -hmm. u.s government um you know concealed it and they're hiding it from the rest of the world yeah well, because there's no evidence for it, and I mean, we have to take the same approach and the same perspective as we do with, you know, every other domain of discourse. And that's essentially, well, as far as we can tell, that hasn't happened. Yeah. So it's possible, but I work on probability rather than possibility. You know, it's possible that anything's true. It's possible that God exists. I just think it's incredibly impro improbable. Yeah. Um, so basically, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Is that Hitchens Razor well, or is it a, um, a Sagan one? I think that's Sagan. Yeah, I think it is Sagan. Hitchens yeah. is that which can or is exerted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. That's the one. Awesome. But yeah, it's it's like um, you know that the government is not efficient. Anyone <laughs> who has ever worked for the government knows that. It cannot keep a secret to save its life. No. And, you know, something as, as you know, monumental as making contact, first contact with an alien race, like, that's something that, that would be public, we would see it, we'd be able to, to, you know, nobody would be able to keep a secret. And, I feel like keeping um, it a secret would just cost too much time and money, and the effort, like, it just I wouldn't be worth it. I just don't think it's possible, you know, well, as, as you were just what's... saying. No, say again? What, what's the, the analogy that, that you gave with uh, Monica Lewinsky? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't remember. Enlighten me. You, you were saying that, like, the, the U.S. government is, um, you know, people say, oh, yeah, they're, they're so efficient at keeping all these secrets and hiding all these things from the general public, and yet they can't even keep a blowjob a secret. Yeah, essentially, yeah. It was, um, it was, I was actually, I remembered where I got that from. I actually got it from Sam Harris when he was talking about why he doesn't buy into the 9-11 uh, conspiracies, and it's a great point. He's like, the U.S. can't hide anything, uh, U.S. <laughs> government. You c couldn't hide semen stains on a dress, and yet you expect <laughs> to be able to tell us that, you know, it did an inside job with 9-11, and that it's got aliens, and that it's got a cure for cancer but still they die of cancer at the same rate as 
normal people. It's it it's just it kind of like just falls into that that pareidolia, seeing patterns when they're not here. And if you yeah. have a nice dose of marijuana, you're <laughs> going to fit well and truly into that category. Um, not that marijuana's bad, well, I've got nothing against it. Those... It's just it does seem to have a correlation. Have you seen those pictures of like the face on Mars? Oh, that oh, that we love that. And then they got like a better and... photo of it, didn't they? <laughs> exactly <laughs> they get like higher and higher and higher resolution pictures as our telescopes get better yeah. and as you know you see what looks like a face on mars and they they image the exact same location mm. and it's just like a crater <laughs> oh man i tell you what those the government's really efficient at uh, going to the sun and moving things about you know to to fool people trying to analyze it i've heard they actually do that though probably i mean <laughs> we've got the flat earth people i just don't you know, anything can happen now. Yeah. I mean, this is so, postmodernism so, uh, 101. <laughs> maybe it's it's the the pancake Mars theory, and Mars <laughs> is just like a pancake. Yeah. It's just it looks around, but it's just because the it's it's facing towards us. <laughs> and you know, all all that our government did is they they launched a nuke at it and they they flipped the pancake. <gasps> That's the one. <laughs> but it's it's. What what boggles my mind with this whole idea that like the government is covering up some type of conspiracy is that the people who claim that they have encounters with aliens and that they got abducted and they got probed and that they saw a light, these are like the dumbest people <laughs> on our planet. I mean, and you I... think like if aliens are coming at all the way across the galaxy, they have the most highly advanced technology in the universe. <laughs> They're able to travel to Earth, but they're not able to tell who the president is or where the pa- systems of power lie. And so they're taking some, you know, drunk farmer in his pickup truck in order to get a closer look at its butthole. <laughs> Just, <laughs> you know, I, I heard a version of that, which is like the idea of this advanced civilization spending you know massive resources to travel light years to just you know basically leave leave a hole in in your farm you know just cut a few of the crops and then just disappears that you know that just as a concept's mental but you're, you're right the idea that they would come here anally assault someone and then disappear is really weird <laughs> what, like, what if it's, it's a bunch of, of just teenage um aliens who are they're pulling pranks <laughs> that's their and, idea of fun and and it's it's like you you have some type of alien police that are you know they're, they're undergoing some type of prime directive of don't interfere with other you know civilizations they have to emerge on their own and then you have a bunch of teenagers that are going and like haha let's go make crop circles on you know <laughs> zxq19 you know that that civilization has no idea about us yet oh, so, oh, let's go down to that egyptian painting and just slightly change it so it looks <laughs> a bit more like a spaceship oh uh, yeah that'll do it oh, face on or, mars or graffiti say, yes the, the pyramids <laughs> the, the pyramids oh we have no idea how to to make these are such advanced uh structures it's like dude it's literally a stack of rocks. <laughs> it's like the most basic of shapes you could possibly. Do. It's a pile of boulders. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I give it to them. You know, like <laughs> to lift up that immense weight and to you know leverage it into mm. position. The the accuracy, the geometry of it all is phenomenal. Like so impressive. Mm. But it's just amazing how people will see something that's just they dedicated their entire lives to this. Like not, they, not as much as the Parthenon. Uh, yeah, I know. Like the Parthenon is so much more precise but we're not assigning that to like alien <laughs> civilizations no, all no, you no. need is a ramp to build a pyramid yeah and the other thing is like they recently found well i say recently it was like the last 20 years i think it was um pretty much demonstrable pr- proof that the pyramids weren't built by slaves they were built by followers of, of the same religion you know they believed mm. if their pharaoh was accepted to the to the heavens or their equivalent then so were they so they spent their entire life you know in this pursuit of building these pyramids and it's just funny to watch people just turn up and go right i can't understand this and then they just personal incredulity fallacy or an argument from ignorance and go we don't know how they did it therefore god or therefore (laughs) aliens it's just bizarre but that that's humankind and i think that's probably one of the biggest reasons intelligent life would not want to visit us (laughs) i love how the only people who say that we don't know how the pyramids are built are people who are not egyptologists Yes. Well, 
Well, here's the thing. Me and Dan started watching a documentary on Netflix, and we just thought it was a generic one about Egypt. We were like, okay, let's... We didn't read about it, we didn't look at it, we were just like, oh, let's just put this on. And was th- it from the History Channel? Yeah. Well, it was... Oh, we, we first started noticing something a bit dodgy when they started referring to people as traditional Egyptologists, and then, like, uh, th- they were interviewing locals that were, like, um, lo- and, like, captioning their names as, like, local wise men and things like this, and then they were like, <laughs> while traditional Egyptologists think that blah, 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 our experts think, and then we were like, mm, where are they going with this? And it was aliens. Like, they they slowly built up to it, but it was all aliens, and we were just like, oh, my God. That reminds me of the, uh, do you know the comedian Darrow O'Brien? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. He he has a bit where he's like, you always have people who, you know, they'll say, like, oh, we gotta get a doctor in here, and then we need a second opinion, so we're gonna go to some, like, whack <laughs> person who's just, like, crazy, and it's like, wait, why? Like, you know, it's, we have all this this highly advanced you know, uh, technology, and yet they you know, they do that with creationism as well, don't they? It's it's like it's the same game with any kind of pseudoscience. You know, you cr- creationism, they do it. They go, here's you know, a prestigious uh, evolutionary biologist, and here's some guy that got his doctorate from theology in <laughs> truthology or some. You know, it's just it's <laughs> mental. Well, and it's it, that that comes down to like not every position is. Um, equally valid you know we don't yeah. teach they, they say teach the controversy it's like no we don't still teach students alchemy or stalk theory of reproduction astrology yeah that's true it, th- those theories got replaced because our understanding expanded yeah. yeah to the point where it's just it's not justifiable anymore it's like that, that's a contending theory fine you know i mean i'd even just call it a contending hypothesis at that point but to assert that it must be taught as equally true is the reason why education is not as good as it could be. <laughs> yeah. So, Steve, Rachel, mm-hmm. if aliens are not currently here with us, if they're not living among us and it's covered up by the government, uh, what are some other solutions to the Fermi paradox? Um, they, they're they all dead already. Yeah, so all dead is definitely yeah. in there, mm-hmm. for sure. So, yeah. like, a, a, some great filter... Mm-hmm. Yeah. So okay, yeah. So, like so they, they never cross cross that threshold. Like something yeah. wiped them all out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and that kind of like goes back to the two that the two that we've kind of brought up in is the great filter, if you will, something that is just something that life just can't get by. Maybe it's that they mess up their own atmosphere and they really don't have the technology and ability to fix it in time, and it just it, that might just be what causes it, or it might just be gamma rays. It just might be some something just so out of out of your ability and it just like boom a star blows up and it shoots out something and it's just gone instantly and the other one is that i think the main one is time like a hundred years is nothing yeah. I, I think it's just it's 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 not even hubris it's just stupid to think i mean maybe it's not maybe maybe einstein's wrong and we can travel faster than the speed of light maybe that is possible um and to be honest i suspect that it probably will be um or probably is we just I have no reason to believe so. So yeah, we've got those two there immediately. But a third one I want to throw out is um why would they be interested? Like we don't pay attention to, you know, pigs, to <laughs> insects, and yet we're genetically almost identical to them. Like for all intent and purposes, they're very, very smart. It's just we define smart according to our own perception of things. Like if they're just a little bit smarter, they're gonna look at us and just think why go there like we don't need their resources so why go there and if they did come here we're in trouble because they're just going to take our resources if evolution tells you anything it's that we don't evolve to be nice necessarily (laughs) that's true well yeah and and that's that's the the, called the zoo hypothesis where basically they're they're observing us but they don't really have any reason to interact or communicate or star trek has the the prime directive where you know we know from studying, you know, contact with with new civilizations that almost always just making contact with them inevitably changes their society usually for the worst. So like whenever we'll we'll meet some new pro- tribe in like Papua New Guinea or something, they'll they'll get access to to guns or something and they'll use it for some advantage to either wipe out all of the the fellow tribes or they'll, you know, completely change the landscape around them. 
And certain technologies people just aren't ready for. You know, you don't necessarily think about, hey, I, I have an axe. I'm going to go chop down every single tree in the forest and then, you know, or on the side of this mountain. And then the next year the, the rain season comes and the landslide wipes out your whole village. You know, we don't think of the consequences of certain technologies. And so maybe there's alien civilizations that are completely aware of us and they're like, oh, hey, like this is kind of some cool little rising civilization, but uh, we don't want to, to interfere because, you know, the, our, they're not ready for our technology yet. That's a good point. I think yeah. that, that kind of also raises the issue of why um, the Drake equation and Fermi paradox are relevant to not just talking about other civilizations, but are kind of relevant to our everyday lives because it gets us thinking about the long term and what's going to happen to us in the long term. And if we can consider the possibility that other civilizations have wiped themselves out by making stupid mistakes, hopefully it can serve as a warning to us not to do the same thing and not to just wreck our planet, you know? Yeah, de definitely, for sure. Um, well, especially if, if we saw instances of intelligent life all over the universe, then... You know, it's like, okay, if, if, if we wreck up this planet, no biggie. But because this is the only one that we know of, yeah. because this is the only source right now that, that we are aware of that has intelligent life, and it might be extremely rare, or it might be extremely fragile, that should be a huge incentive for yeah. us to try to, to foster um, life, for us to try to expand and to colonize other planets, and to protect and, and cherish the life that we have on this this planet. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah. So yeah, there's we talked about some different filters. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have. Um, you were mentioning earlier, Rachel. There there were um, a total of five mass extinction events that we're aware of, and that's things like super volcanoes, uh, climate change. You know, the great oxidation event yeah. that you know there was so much oxygen in our atmosphere that the life that wasn't used to it was wiped out. Mm -hmm. um, you can have other things. You could have uh, your, your home star expand or solar radiation wipe out life. You can have asteroids that completely, you know, we had one that killed off the dinosaurs. If there was one that was maybe, uh, a, you know, a certain degree bigger than the one that wiped out the, the dinosaurs, it could have completely sterilized our entire planet. Yeah. Um, but the, the other thing, another solution would be that some type of alien super predator. <gasps> Why do you think that an alien civilization would want to wipe us out? Because by competition. Resource, for resources and competition, oh, yeah, yeah. that too. Yeah. Or what if it just sees us as a threat? Or what if it just sees us as tasty? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. That, you can't put, looking at us, you can't put that past yeah. a civilization, you know? I mean, um, I'm not speaking for you two, but I think I would make a great meal. Just, just saying. <laughs> You're advertising yourself to cannibals. No. <laughs> the aliens fly by and they just see like a chef says, I yeah. make a great meal. You're, you're, you're going to you. get a visit from that plastic bag again today. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, you want to contact us? Um, it's just hovering outside so my well, window. We were just talking about, you were just talking about how, how one of us is, is an alien. Mm. No. Next episode, tune in and Steve will talk about his life as a reptilian. <laughs> I will. I hope nobody watches the vi this video on YouTube because they notice glitches where my uh, skin doesn't quite, you know, sit onto me properly and you can see my lizardness underneath. Careful, E.T., the government's listening. Yes. What, if, what if I'm not here next episode because you've eaten me? Well, <gasps> no, speculation. Oh, no. Oh, it's okay. We've already recorded the next one, so we're safe. Episode four, uh, I'll oh, be yeah. missing. Yeah, it'll be yeah. episode four. Yeah, that'll be the one. <laughs> ah, brilliant. So, so it as far as um, the solutions, as it were, so can you go over what we've said before? So one of them is that um, they're not interested. Mm -hmm. Second is that they, well, not interested slash don't care. Um, what, the main one that I seem to think, uh, well, the, that I do think, is that it's just not been enough time. Um well, as far as the time goes, the biggest thing there is that um, distance has prohibited contact or detection. Yes. That one, that one really applies to um, galaxies outside of the Milky Way. Because, you know, we think about the, the hundreds... Oh, God, I forget if it's 
300 billion stars on the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. I, I forget the exact number, but it's a stupidly big number of stars. But then the total number of galaxies that um, are in our universe mm -hmm. outside the Milky Way is, is also in the, the hundreds and hundreds of billions. And I, I think it was just last year or the year before where they, they realized it was like 10 times bigger than they had thought. That's but insane. those those galaxies are so far away, and they're expanding away at an ever increasing rate. And the the chance of making some kind of contact with them is is just completely outside the realm of our our at least current possibilities. Something that I just um I just remembered, and I'm sure this is actually one of the solutions. But you can tell me what it is. But we are using radio waves or however we, whatever methods we are to try and listen. It seems to me that's just arbitrary. So you could just have, if, if some species that, you know, depends on echolocation was to just like release out a super echolocation or something, you know, just some kind of way that they, they can communicate and then be wondering why aren't any civilizations responding to us? It seems very presumptuous to think that one, they would know that language two that they could interpret it and decipher it from, you know, all of the other clutter. And then of course that they would care. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is. Well, a, a couple things on that note is that one echolocation is not possible because it relies on sound. And first yes. of all, sound is, is yeah. much, 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 much slower than the speed of light. It is, yeah, yeah. And second, you cannot send an, an echolocation signal through a vacuum. No, you can't. And as you said, there's there's not really sound, etc. So it's not going to work. But, you know, it, surely waves, there's other waves, ways that you could do it. Like other radio forms. Radio waves travel at the speed of light and it's, you know, the, it relies on electromagnetism. Mm. And so as far as we know, that is the only and the best way to communicate. But it, maybe there's some you know, something that we haven't discovered yet. Maybe there's something about, you know, the universe and time and space that, you know, we're going to find a better way. And I, I think it might be incredibly naive and presumptuous <laughs> for me to say that there just absolutely isn't. But as far as we know, there's, there's nothing like that. Yeah. So if there is, if there is a highly advanced alien civilization and radio waves are the best method and the only method really to communicate across vast distances like that, then we should expect that that's what they would be listening in on and that that's what they would be trying to communicate back on. But again, it's, you know, as as much as I think that's the case, uh, I don't know, maybe there is some other way of communicating that we just haven't discovered at all. Well, no, you, I mean, you solve what my concern was, and that is that it's not completely arbitrary. You know, it, it's a solution that many intelligent species could get to because they realize oh this travels really fast uh so maybe that is but if it turns out that things can travel faster if you just have a certain theory or a certain understanding about you know it might be in the quantum world etc then they may not even consider that because they may be well ahead of us <laughs> ahead of us by well, considering and their things and going well any smart creature any smart uh alien would figure this out and we don't and we maybe will never will do <laughs> but even if they're listening to us then you know they're they're listening for us in the the same you know uh frequency or whatever that we're broadcasting out at then we haven't been around that long to be detectable yeah. you know we've only been around here broadcasting for about you know 100 years or so 100 light years you take the the, the fact that the milky way galaxy is 100,000 light years across that's a tiny 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 fraction of yeah. the size of our galaxy so it's going to be a while before we uh, do you, are Do you think it's kind of detectable. possible that if there are other like species or life out there that they've like come across our planet before, but we weren't advanced enough for them to take notice of us and they just kind of moved on? Do you think that's a possibility? It's, it's possible, but I think if, if an alien civilization were to travel, to, mm. to try to colonize um, space and they were to... to find our planet and realize that it was habitable and that it was, you know, uh, suitable for life that, you know, maybe they, they came and uh, if they're going to travel all the way out here and use all the resources to get here, they might as well set something up. But it's possible that, you know, maybe while the earth was, you know, extremely hot, maybe during the Hidean era and it was not even remotely habitable to life, mm. maybe they passed by mm. and maybe they were in the neighborhood. 
you know, it's... you know, if they were like, if they, well, well they would have to be. They're well traveled. They might be bored of seeing life. And there's only certain <laughs> types of planets and life that they're interested in visiting. See, I always view these kind of things through the through the purview, through the through the vision of evolution, assuming that they would be the product, at least in part of that. Um, and it might be that, you know, we, we've went past. I can't remember what planet it is or it might actually be Europe. I don't know where it is, actually. But there's a place where methane basically is a solid, a liquid and a gas, just as we have water. Do you guys, have, um, by any chance, know what planet that is? It's in our solar I'm, system I'm not sure. or moon. Fair enough. Um, it, I, I don't think it's a planet. No, no, no. I yeah, it's either is it Europa? It or might. Cassini? It might be Europa. You know, I think <laughs> it's, it's something to do with Jupiter or Saturn. Um, but they might be interested in that. You know, because yeah. as you were saying earlier on, Rachel, they, why would we assume that they're carbon based? You know, mm-hmm. so they could go there. And um, that's what they would be interested in. So, but they might, it's possible, they just go past us and just not interested. They just look down and go, oh, look, another life. Another, <laughs> an, an, another, another, another planet lit up with yeah. artificial light. Yeah. How, <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's why, like, you know, everything on Earth that we know of, every form of life, is carbon based. One of the reasons that we think carbon's the most likely is because it, it bonds with so many, as far as the chemistry goes. It's you have carbon and then it's like you might be able to come up with something with like silicon and stuff. But like carbon seems to be the most likely candidate. But no, we, we only have one sample. We only have us. We, we don't know what the possibilities are because we haven't seen any other possibilities. That's true. Does that mean that there are none? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but, so it's one thing that I realized when speaking about the Drake equation and the Fermi paradox before is that one of the first things people kind of debate and get in discussion about is, do you actually believe, you know, as we kind of touched at the beginning, actually, do you actually believe there's aliens? Cause a lot of people don't. And it seems that actually quite quickly, all of us are like, no, there's almost certainly life elsewhere. I think it's worth just, just emphasizing for the viewers that a lot of people do actually look at the Drake equation. I think it's utter nonsense. Whereas I do think it's absolutely valuable for just illustrating the, the size, the, just just all of the factors that mean that it is very, very likely that there's life out elsewhere. Um but it, and it's probably it's probably even very, very likely that there's conscious life elsewhere. Mm. It's just but then whether course, it's intelligent and whether it's seeking the life. Yeah. These 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 are the very thing. interesting questions. I mean ultimately I imagine that most people that do speak about this subject leave as they kind of went into it, in the sense that it's speculation and so they can't there's no answer it's not like e equals mc squared as you were Mm -hmm. saying you know um it's not a scientific equation it's a a colloquial equation if you will what for you thomas like what do you think the main reason is have we already covered it or is it maybe something else another factor or another another reason that's given honestly I, i think that it's i don't think that it's just one of them i think that you know life probably is fairly rare as far as intelligent communicating life goes. I think that we're looking at a massive, massive time frame. We're looking at, you know, millions and hundreds of millions, billions of years even. It's possible that there was a massive intergalactic civilization that completely wiped itself out or that was destroyed or that had some type of competition or something and that you know, went extinct millions of years ago. We're just, we're looking at huge time frames, and we've really only been here broadcasting for a tiny, tiny period of time. We might make contact here in the next few thousand years. I don't know that it'll happen in our lifespans, but it's, you know, we're, we're looking at a tiny drop in an ocean in a fraction of a second and expecting to find a whale. <laughs> and that's, you know, it's it's like... Steve, that that's kind of the analogy that you gave was like you know t- taking a bucket in the the ocean and looking for whales. Yeah. You know, but it's it, we're looking at, we're we're not looking at a bucket. We're looking at a drop. Mm. And so it's it's kind of unreasonable for us to expect that on this tiny tiny speck in the middle of nowhere, that in this blink of an eye, that we've even been detectable, that something could have reached us by now that something could have communicated with us by now. I think if we make contact, it probably won't be with with organic life. It'll probably be with some type of robotic probe. Mm. Just because it's so much easier. Look at how many satellites we've sent out into space. Look at 
how, you know, the, we haven't sent any humans into deep space. You know, look at how many satellites we have, you know, orbiting Earth and flying through our solar system and whatnot. Yeah. It's it's so much harder for life, for organic life, to survive mm-hmm. the vacuum of space, to survive long space flight, to, to endure solar radiation. Whereas a robot can do that much easier. I, I think it's it's much, much more likely that we'll find some type of self-replicating alien probe. Mm. And that maybe then after, you know, we've communicated with it, after they have some reason to think that we're not a threat to them or that um, and that, that they should make contact, that it might be hundreds of thousands or even millions of years before they set out to reach us. And by the time they get here, maybe we'll be wiped out. <laughs> maybe there'll be nothing left. And so I, I really don't know what the exact solution to it is. Um, but whether... Whether there are aliens or not, if purely for the reason of, of you know, trying to survive as a species and extend life, I think that we should explore the universe. We should probe the universe. We should listen, you know, not like crazy conspiracy theorists, <laughs> uh, you know, ufologists who are like, oh, I saw an alien. But like like SETI's doing, like scientists are doing, where they're, they're actually trying to observe it. They're using their instruments, they're using their tools, and they're trying to see, are we alone in the universe? I think we should be taking samples from other planets. We should be drilling into um, Mars. We should be exploring Europa and Cassini and other um, moons and planets in our solar system trying to find life. And if we do, I think that that opens up a a huge uh, realm of possibilities for to us to, to understand maybe a little bit better about where we came from and about how we can preserve life on our planet. Yeah, no, well said. I couldn't couldn't agree more. It's yeah. uh, if if only if only most people thought that way, it would be amazing <laughs> to see where exactly we could go and what exactly yeah. we could discover, rather than putting our attention onto uh, Kim Kardashian's ass. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you know, there's I I really encourage all of our listeners to go and and just look up the. The Fermi Paradox, there's a a Wikipedia article that has a bunch of solutions listed there. Um, There's also a bunch of great videos on it and stuff. But there's there's stuff we haven't really touched on so much like um, perhaps we're living in a simulation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why there's no aliens. Mm -hmm. That maybe this is all a science experiment. Um, Maybe there's um, aliens that... uh, there there are other aliens and maybe they're aware of us, but maybe they're all hiding because there's some super predator out there that's going and hunting down and wiping out all other competition. And so like uh, one interesting thing is um, maybe we've been looking for other planets and we haven't found them because they're masking their location. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, There is a really cool paper written by uh, Professor David Kipling at Columbia University on using ma- lasers to mask solar transits mm-hmm. and to, to hide your location, you know, the, the location of, of your planet from other civilizations. And what if aliens are doing that? What if we can't detect them because of, of you know, they're, they're afraid and they're hiding, you know, there, there's so many different possibilities, but it's, you know, yeah, I encourage everyone to go and learn more and we'll, we'll put links in the show notes to a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. for people to go and, and, you know, explore and learn and discover more about what we know and, you know, the past of, of, all of our discovery and, and understanding of, of space and aliens. And maybe we can, can use that to, to help us create a little, little bit of a better future mm-hmm. for, for the, the human race, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah no, I don't feel as much more. I can add to that. <laughs> Very well said. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys as always for joining me next week. Everybody be sure to tune in for uh, Rachel is going to be talking about leading the, the episode discussing what makes you you so that's going to be a super fun one <laughs> this has been an absolute blast and now we want you to join in the conversation over on the here and how facebook and twitter pages or follow us on pinterest and instagram if you just want some of the dankest of sciencey memes if you like one of our particular styles check out each of our youtube channels rachel oates rationality rules by stephen woodford and holy kool-aid by me thomas westbrook to find all of our episodes, show notes, contact information, and more, warp on over to our home base, theherenow.com. If you enjoyed this episode and want us to succeed in spreading the love of science, you can help us out by 
giving us a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher. And to all our friends and family listening, thank you for spending this episode with us. We'll be back to explore another exciting big idea next week. Now go create something magnificent.